Sometimes, notwithstanding the snow, when I returned from my walk at evening, I crossed the deep tracks of a woodchopper leading from my door, and found his pile of whittlings on the hearth, and my house filled with the odor of his pipe. February 1846. Dear Henry, we have not seen you much since the holidays. I feel that you might wish to forget us, and our mutual loss as well. Even though you don't say his name aloud, I know you think of our poor brother John often, as do I. Your loving sister, Sophia. When I had been exposed to the rudest blasts a long time, my whole body began to grow torpid. When I reached the genial atmosphere of my house, I soon recovered my faculties and prolonged my life. Interesting. February, 1842. Dearest Sophia, I have just heard of poor John's passing, and am suffering from the loss of such a friend. I send my heartfelt best to your family, especially Henry. How will he go on without his brother and best friend? The leaves are falling, falling, solemnly and slow. Caw, caw! The rooks are calling. It is a sound of woe. Ellen. There is nothing I can do for the young man. It's the lockjaw, and the poison has gone directly to his blood. Oh, what will we do without our John? He is the light of our household. You must make him comfortable as you can. See there, your brother Henry holds him closely now, but still he slips away. May God be with him. We are lost. We are lost. Our best flower is fading. Do not trouble yourself much to get new things, whether clothes or friends. Turn the old. Return to them. Things do not change. We change. Sell your clothes and keep your thoughts. Nature and human life are as various as our several constitutions. Who shall say what prospect life offers to another? Could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for an instant? Good day, Henry. Good afternoon. What can...
I do not speak to those who are well employed, in whatever circumstances, and they know whether they are well employed or not, but mainly to the mass of men who are discontented, and idly complaining of the hardness of their lot or of the times, when they might improve them. the news about the fugitive slaves that were caught stealing food just last night out by your pond? Quite the excitement. To think, they made it so far only to be caught for lack of supplies. My friend Thoro, I have been hurried and have not settled your payment with Graham. I did see him. But it was at a crowded dinner party where I had no chance to question him on business. I enclose you twelve dollars for your article on Maine scenery, as promised. I know it is worth more, though I have not found time to read it. Uh, it is rather long for my columns and too fine for the millions, but I consider it a cheap bargain and shall print it myself if I do not find another magazine. What about your book? Is it going well? Yours, Horace Greeley. The greater part of what my neighbors call good I believe in my soul to be bad, and if I repent of anything it is very likely to be my good behavior. What demon possessed me that I behaved so well? It is a terrible blow. First, your brother John is cut down so suddenly. And now my own dear little boy. Unbearable, truly. I may find solace in a long trip, far away from the woods and trails that remind me of him, so... You are a true friend to watch over my home while I travel. You are more like a brother than my own is to me.
Henry, are you all right? My dearest love, Lydian. Our boy, our boy, our little boy is gone. Young Waldo was taken ill on Monday evening and died last night. All his wonderful beauty could not save him. He gave up his innocent breath last night, and my world this morning is cold. Shall we ever dare to love anything again? Farewell and farewell, oh my boy. Come home to us as soon as you are able. R.W. Dear friend, my heart goes out to you and Lydian on hearing the news of young Waldo's sudden passing. Such a blow, such a blow. I hate to bring more sadness, but I must resign from our dial. If it is to continue, you must pick up the reins yourself and drive it forward. If only I had been paid some support for my work, I would have remained. My financial options are limited, and so must seek employment as a teacher to support the work I do as a writer. This makes my work on the dial impossible now. Regretfully, Margaret.
The change from storm and winter to serene and mild weather, from dark and sluggish hours to bright and elastic ones, is a memorable crisis which all things proclaim. It is seemingly instantaneous at last. March, 1846. Henry. The ice in the pond is breaking up, and spring is in the air. I know your favorite season in the woods is approaching, but we hope to see you at home soon. Do your work and come home to us strong and healthy. Remember that you are our only brother now, and mother's only son, Sophia. My dear Henry, you have nearly weathered the winter in our woods and seem to be well situated to bear witness to the thaw of your habitat into mud and clay. Are you still finding inspiration out there on the damp edge of our society? Recall, if you will, that a frog was made to live in a swamp, but a man was not made to live in a swamp. Yours ever, R.W.E. Dear Henry, I hear that you have offered your cabin as location for the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society to hold its anniversary gathering. I commend you for this and for ringing the bell of freedom from your post in the woods. However, a more desperate friend also needs your help. Look for my instructions here tomorrow morning and be ready. Yours, A. Bronson Alcott. Interesting.
I see you have no head for work now, Henry, but I fear for your genius if you don't go back to writing. What do you find on these long walks of yours? Is there a hidden spring of solace hidden in our woods? Dear Mr. Emerson, it was good to dine with you and Mr. Thoreau last week. He has written a good piece in the last style, which gives the spirit of what he sees. Even as a lake reflects its wooded banks, showing every leaf, yet giving the wild beauty of the whole scene. I sense, however, that such an uncompromising person is fitter to meet occasionally in the open air than to have as a permanent guest at table and fireside. I feel from your cooling praise that you may have suffered some inconvenience in your relations with him. Sincerely, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Thank you for coming, Ellen. I'm so worried about our Henry. Without John, he is a shadow without its source. He was so ill at first, and now he roams the woods for hours on end. No one knows where he goes, what he does, but he returns sad and silent. Gone is our merry Huckleberry captain. I think he intends to go back to work with Father in the pencil factory now that the school is closed. But I believe that kind of captivity might kill our wild bird spirit forever. March, 1842. Dear Ellen, thank you for your kind words and sentiments. Our loss has been almost more than we can bear. Poor Henry does not speak John's name, and last month was strangely struck with all the same symptoms of lockjaw we saw in John, fever and sweats and cramping of the jaw. We were so afraid that we might lose him as well. Sincerely, Sophia. Good day, Henry. There Good is afternoon. an incessant influx of novelty into the world and yet we tolerate incredible dullness. Oh, it's just you, Henry. Such doldrums we are in. I can barely move my fingers in this cold. Will we ever see the spring again? <laughs> <laughs> 